Hello and welcome to another edition of the Cord Blood Seminar Series. My name is Dr. Supipi Duffy. I am the Director of Advanced Health and Genetics at HealthCord Cryogenics. Today I'll be talking to you about cord blood and cord tissue banking to give you an understanding of how the process works and the importance of it. Here is a quick overview of today's seminar. I'm going to start by highlighting the difference between cord blood and cord tissue, then introduce you to stem cells, more specifically newborn stem cells, talk about how stem cells are currently being used to treat a variety of diseases, and how scientists around the world are exploring their potential for many different future applications. We'll end with a quick recap of the cord blood banking process. We're going to begin with a glimpse into embryonic development. Once conceived, a baby goes through several different stages of development. Every baby starts off as a single fertilized egg cell. Then, within the span of just a few weeks, the embryo goes on to establish the basic body plan of an adult. Once this is done, then it's a matter of growing and refining these basic features to become fully developed. All of these developmental events happen in utero or inside the womb of the mother and is only possible because of an amazing organ, the placenta. The placenta is a temporary organ that grows during pregnancy. It's the only dispensable organ in the human body. The placenta attaches to the wall of the uterus and forms a connection between the mother and the developing baby. This connection is essential for providing the baby with the oxygen and the nutrients necessary for growth and for removing the waste products from the baby's blood. The blood vessels of the mother and the baby are found side by side inside the placenta. This keeps their blood supply separate. You will notice that the umbilical cord connects the growing baby to the mother. The umbilical cord itself has two components, cord blood and cord tissue. Cord blood refers to the blood found within the umbilical cord and cord tissue refers to the umbilical cord itself. Given that the placenta is a temporary organ that develops during pregnancy, shortly after a baby is born, the body also expels the placenta. In the past, once the umbilical cord was cut, the cord and the placenta were discarded as medical waste. Today, it's well established that cord blood, cord tissue, and even the placenta are sources of valuable stem cells and, when possible, should be preserved. What are stem cells? Stem cells are early stage cells that have the capacity to grow and give rise to other types of cells in the body. They are useful for repairing damaged cells, rebuilding tissue, and helping our bodies heal. Cord blood and cord tissue are both sources of newborn stem cells. Cord blood contains hematopoietic stem cells. They give rise to other types of blood cells and immune cells. Cord tissue contains a different type of stem cells, known as mesenchymal stem cells. They have the ability to give rise to bone cells, muscle cells, cartilage cells, and nerve cells. Together, cord blood and cord tissue contain two different kinds of stem cells that can be used to grow a number of different cell types in the body. Hematopoietic stem cells have been used to treat diseases for more than 60 years. The very first stem cell transplant was performed in 1957, more than 60 years ago by Dr. E. Donald Thomas. He went on to win the Nobel Prize in 1990 for his discovery of cell transplants as a way to treat human diseases. Today, hematopoietic stem cells are used to treat over 80 life-threatening diseases including cancers, immune system disorders, blood disorders, and metabolic disorders. Hematopoietic stem cell therapies that are currently in use can be broadly categorized into two groups, allogeneic stem cell therapies and autologous stem cell therapies. Allogeneic stem cell therapy involves collecting healthy stem cells from a donor and transplanting them into a patient as a treatment option. Autologous stem cell therapy involves replacing the stem cells of a patient with his or her own healthy stem cells. For example, when autologous therapy is used to treat cancer, healthy stem cells are collected and extracted from a patient 
prior to chemotherapy. Following chemotherapy, damaged stem cells are replaced with the patient's own healthy stem cells. According to a survey from 2012, about 47% of hematopoietic stem cell therapies involve allogeneic stem cell transplants. This means before a patient can be treated, you have to find a matching donor to provide them with a healthy stem cell sample. Let's look at allogeneic stem cell therapy in more detail. The initial stages of this procedure involves taking stem cell samples from a donor, either using a blood sample or in a majority of the cases, a sample from the bone marrow. In the next step, stem cells from these samples are purified using specialized antibodies. These selected stem cells are further processed before being transplanted or infused into a patient. Next, I want to highlight some of the limitations associated with allogeneic stem cell therapy. First, you have to find a matching donor, a step that can be extremely difficult. Even with a matched sample, there's a high risk of rejection due to what is known as the graft versus host disease. This is a case where the immune system of the patient recognizes the transplanted cells as being foreign and starts attacking them. Next, bone marrow donation involves surgery. It is a surgical procedure which is invasive even for the donor. The final point to consider is that the age of the donor may be relevant because even stem cells age. Studies have compared stem cells from young versus older donors and noticed significant differences in robustness in these samples. You will want to explore our lesson on stem cells and aging if you want to learn more about this topic. I will end this video by highlighting some of the potential stem cell sources that are available for cell therapies. These include adult stem cells, which can be isolated from the bone marrow, and a variety of other tissues. Isolating adult stem cells can be difficult because the number of stem cells in our body decreases as we age. Induced pluripotent stem cells or iPS cells are another source that's been widely explored in the lab. These are stem cells made in the lab by reverse engineering adult cells. IPS cells have contributed to revolutionary discoveries involving stem cells in the lab. However, the safety and efficacy of using them for cell therapy remains to be established. Last but not least, we come to newborn stem cells. Newborn stem cells refer to stem cells from cord blood and cord tissue. The main limitation here is that newborn stem cells can only be collected at birth. Stem cell research is one of the fastest growing branches of medical research. Currently, there are over a thousand clinical trials exploring the use of both cord blood and cord tissue stem cells to treat diseases like osteoporosis, Alzheimer's, diabetes, breast cancer, liver failure, and arthritis. For instance, there has been a tremendous amount of growth in the number of clinical trials that were registered between 2004 and 2018. If we focus in on the clinical trials involving mesenchymal stem cells, the kind of stem cells found in cord tissue, between 2005 and 2015, the number of these trials increased by tenfold. When we categorize these trials by stem cell types and transplant types, one thing you notice is that the umbilical cord stem cells or newborn stem cells from cord blood and cord tissue are the second largest category being explored for their potential as a future therapeutic. It is likely that scientists are only at the tip of the iceberg in terms of developing new treatments for diseases using stem cells. This is why the rest of the video will focus in on clinical trials that are exploring the use of stem cell therapy for treating heart disease and type 2 diabetes. The STAR Heart study is one of the largest clinical trials that looked at using stem cells to treat patients with heart disease. This trial involved 391 patients with chronic heart failure who had experienced a heart attack 3 to 8 years prior to the study. 
Results from this study showed that patients who received stem cells experienced significant improvement even five years after treatment. The graph highlighted here looks at ejection fraction, which is a measure of how much blood is pumped out of the left ventricle with each contraction. Higher numbers correspond to better efficiency. You can see that patients who received stem cells, shown in blue, experienced an improvement in heart function after treatment and were able to maintain these improvements in the long term. What's more, there was also a significant decrease in the long-term mortality rate of patients who received stem cells after a heart attack. The average mortality rate of the group that received stem cells was 0.75% per year compared to the 3.68% per year seen in the control group that did not receive stem cells. To summarize, the STAR heart study suggests that stem cell therapy can improve heart function quality of life, and enhanced survival rates in people with chronic heart failure. Next, I want to highlight clinical trials involving type 2 diabetes and stem cell therapy. Type 2 diabetes is a metabolic disease linked to the hormone insulin. Insulin is responsible for regulating blood sugar levels. People with type 2 diabetes are unable to either produce insulin or their bodies have stopped responding to insulin so their blood sugar levels remain constantly high. The data I'm going to show you comes from 11 clinical trials involving 386 patients with type 2 diabetes. They were treated with stem cell therapy. This is a summary of data looking at insulin requirement after 12 months of therapy. You can see that majority of the patients showed significant improvement. For example, 31% of the patients who received mesenchymal stem cells no longer required insulin injections. Based on the results from these clinical trials, we can predict that perhaps one day, stem cell therapy may become a standard of care for treating diabetes. Now that you know more about newborn stem cells and their value, I want to end by highlighting the process involved in stem cell banking. When a parent decides to preserve their baby's stem cells, we ask them to register online to receive a collection kit. Ideally, this should be done four to six weeks ahead of the due date. Once you register, a collection kit will be shipped right to your house. All you have to do is remember to bring it to the hospital on the day of delivery. Once the baby is born and the umbilical cord is cut according to the birth plan of the mom, the healthcare provider can go ahead and collect the leftover blood in the umbilical cord and the cord itself. Everything that you need for these steps, from the collection bags to storage vessels, are included in the kit. In the lab, cord blood and cord tissue samples go through several different screening steps. Once this is done, the samples get cryogenically preserved and get stored in vapor phase storage tanks. And they will remain in storage for the lifetime of the baby or until they become necessary. So to recap, I've told you about the amazing growth stem cell research is experiencing at the moment and how this could potentially lead to many new therapies in the future. I've also highlighted the role newborn stem cells can have in terms of advancing these studies and in terms of forming future therapeutics. I want to stress that both cord blood and cord tissue are valuable sources of stem cells and that their main limitation is that they're only available at birth. I'm going to end by thanking you for your time and we can now start taking questions.